So I like to think of the kidneys as guardians of body fluid homeostasis, and they participate in this role by a few mechanisms. So first of all, they exert long-term control of body fluid volumes. And this is particularly important in the control of blood volume for the purpose of long-term regulation of blood pressure. Secondly, they control electrolyte concentrations, uh, sodium concentrations, potassium, bicarbonate, calcium, etc., to ensure that these electrolytes fall within their normal ranges. And finally, the kidneys excrete metabolic wastes. In order to understand how the kidneys are able to accomplish these functions, you have to appreciate the function of the nephron. So a nephron is the functional unit of the kidney. You can think of the kidneys as a collection of nephrons, approximately a million nephrons per kidney. So what is a nephron? So a nephron has two main structural components. You have first the glomerulus, which is the capillary component, and then you have the tubule, which is a hollow epithelial lined structure. So more on the structure in a moment, but the basic purpose of the nephron is to first to filter blood plasma and then to process that fluid and ultimately convert it into its final urinary product. There are two types of nephrons in the kidneys. You have cortical nephrons and juxtamedullary nephrons. So first, the cortical nephrons, or also known as superficial nephrons, these are the most abundant of the nephrons in the kidneys. Approximately 80% of your nephrons are these cortical nephrons. You can think of these as basically the worker bees of the kidneys. These are the nephrons that are responsible for a majority of the filtration and a majority of the fluid processing that occurs in the kidneys. The juxtamedullary nephrons, on the other hand, are specialized nephrons, and their main function in the kidney is to create a hyperosmotic medullary interstitial fluid, or ISF. And this is important for urine concentration at a time when water conservation is at a premium. Two distinguishing structural features of juxtamedullary nephrons that contribute to this role is, first of all, they have an elongated lupa henle. So their lupa henle extends down into the renal medulla. And this elongated lupa henle augments the nephron's ability to participate in countercurrent multiplication, which is the process that's important for creating that hyperosmotic medullary interstitial fluid. Another important feature of juxtamedullary nephrons is they have specialized paratubular capillaries termed vasorecta. It's in the vasorecta where countercurrent exchange occurs, which is important for preserving the hyperosmotic interstitial fluid. More on these topics later. So the kidneys have an interesting and unique organization with regards to its vasculature at the level of the nephron. So most systemic perfusion systems consist of an arterial, a capillary bed, which ultimately drains blood into a venule, which then directs blood back towards the heart on the venous side of circulation. The kidney's perfusion system, on the other hand, consists of two arterioles and two capillary beds in series. So blood coming from the renal artery ultimately makes its way down to the afferent arterial, the glomerular capillary, which is where filtration takes place. More on that in a moment. And the blood slash plasma that isn't filtered then collects into the efferent arterial before moving along to the paratubular capillary before making its way back to the heart on the venous side of circulation. In order for the kidneys to function, they must receive an enormous perfusion supply. The kidneys receive approximately 20% of the cardiac output. So the average cardiac output for the adult human is somewhere in the neighborhood of 5 liters per minute. Therefore, the amount of blood directed to the kidneys is somewhere in the range of 1 liter of whole blood per minute. That equates to be about 600 milliliters of blood plasma per minute, blood plasma being the watery extracellular blood fluid, which is filterable within the glomerulus. So here we take a closer look at the renal corpuscle, which is the site of the filtration in the kidneys. Again, the major capillary bed where this filtration takes place is the glomerular capillary. The filtration occurs via a process called ultrafiltration. This is where the hydrostatic pressure of the blood, essentially the blood pressure, is pushing the fluid out of the capillary walls, which then is allowed to collect into Bowman space, which is continuous with the rest of the nephron. The afferent and 
efferent arterioles are not just conduits or portals for the blood to move to and from the glomerulus. The resistance of these arterioles is regulatable by a variety of factors where changes in resistance of these arterioles can influence both the rate of filtration and the renal blood flow. So I said before, the kidneys receive approximately 600 milliliters per minute of blood plasma. Approximately 20% of that 600 milliliters is filtered by the glomerulus, so forms that initial filtrate that makes its way into Bowman space. This equates to be a glomerular filtration rate of somewhere in the neighborhood of 120 milliliters per minute. The composition of this filtrate is described as plasma water. That is, it has virtually identical concentrations of most of the constituents of the blood plasma, the electrolytes, so the sodium, the chloride, the bicarbonate, the potassium, the calcium, etc., has the same concentration in this filtrate as it does in the blood plasma itself. Also, the concentrations of other small essential solutes such as glucose, amino acids, lactate, etc., those too exist in the same concentration in the filtrate as well. So the main constituents of the blood plasma that are lacking in the filtrate is protein. Protein is not readily filterable by the glomerulus, so it gets left behind, and the blood cells. Now that we have that initial filtrate that was formed by the glomerulus, the next steps are going to involve processing that fluid by the various nephron segments. But before we discuss that, let's take a moment to consider the main structural features of the nephron. If you were to take a cross-section of the nephron and rotate it 90 degrees, it would look a little something like this. There are three main regions to take note of. So first, inside the nephron itself is the nephron lumen or the tubular lumen. Uh, this lumen is surrounded by a layer of epithelial cells. These epithelial cells are linked together by tight junctions, which separates the nephron lumen from the extracellular fluid of the kidneys which is called the interstitial fluid or the ISF. So once that filtrate is formed, the hydrostatic pressure within Bowman's space pushes that fluid into the first of these main nephron segments, and that is the proximal tubule. So the main function of the proximal tubule is to reabsorb most of what was filtered. So you said before, the, that initial filtrate is approximately 120 milliliters per minute. That's a lot of fluid to lose per minute. And if you also remember that that fluid has a number of substances that your body never intended to get rid of, things like glucose and amino acids and all those electrolytes as well, the purpose of the proximal tubule is to reclaim most of that stuff, most of those things that were filtered that you never intended to get rid of in the first place. So this ends up being approximately 65% of the water and of those basic electrolytes, such as sodium and chloride, those are reabsorbed and put back into circulation here at the proximal tubule. Greater than 90% of the essential solutes are reabsorbed here in the proximal tubule. Substances like glucose, like glucose reabsorption is approximately 99% and that occurs right here in the proximal tubule. Amino acids, those are reabsorbed in the proximal tubule as well. So that's really the main function of the proximal tubule is to reclaim all these things that your body never intended to get rid of in the first place. The other main function of the proximal tubule is metabolic secretions. So there's extensive secretion mechanisms that increases the clearance rates of these substances, and this happens in the proximal tubule as well. So most of the fluid is reabsorbed in the proximal tubule, and the remaining fluid then makes its way to the next sort of main nephron segment, and that is the loop of Henle. So the loop of Henle, there's three subcomponents to it. You have the descending limb, the thin ascending limb, and then thick ascending limb. Now there's a variety of different transport processes that are taking place at each component. For instance, the descending limb, this is where water reabsorption occurs here. For both the thin and the thick ascending limb, you have sodium and chloride reabsorption. You also have the reabsorption of a few other substances as well, such as potassium and calcium and magnesium. But overall, there are two main functions for the loop of Henle. The first is to create a hyperosmotic medullary interstitial fluid, and this occurs via countercurrent multiplication. So a hyperosmotic interstitial fluid, meaning that it's going to create a very salty environment out here in the extracellular fluid. This will be important for urine concentration during times where water conservation is at a premium. 
The other main function of the loop of Henle is to produce a hypoosmotic tubular fluid. So by the time the fluid leaves the thick ascending limb and make its way to sort of the distal portions of the nephron, that fluid is very hypoosmotic. And this is important for times where urine dilution needs to occur, times where solute conservation is important because we have too much water and not enough solute. By the time the fluid leaves the loop of Henle, we're left with just a small fraction of the initial amount that was filtered, and it makes its way to the distal portions of the nephron. We have the distal tubules slash connecting tubules, and then also the cortical collecting duct area here, so the superficial region of the collecting duct. These regions of the nephron have similar functional roles, which is why I'm kind of lumping them all together. And that is these areas are responsible for the fine tuning of electrolyte concentrations. So again, if you think back at the beginning, we were filtering an enormous amount of fluid. The vast majority of what was filtered was never intended to be eliminated from the body in the first place. And so the proximal tubule recovered a lot of that. The loop of Henle recovered more water and solute during the process of countercurrent multiplication to create that hyperosmotic interstitial fluid. And what we're left with at the end is, is now the kidney is going to make some hard decisions. Now the kidney is going to decide, well, how much sodium do we need? How much potassium do we need? How much magnesium do we need? And those questions are based on what are the body fluid conditions or the homeostatic challenges that we're undergoing at that moment. Did we just eat a whole bunch of chips and not have enough water? Water to wash it down with. Well, then we need to get rid of some of that extra sodium and we need to conserve and hang on to uh, some of that water. Did we just eat a bunch of bananas? Well, maybe we need to get rid of some of that potassium and not hang on to as much of it as we normally would otherwise. So these are the sorts of issues that are addressed in the distal portion of the nephron. In addition to these nephron segments, out in the distal portion of the nephron, I want to point out there's a specialized region of cells called the macula densa, the macula densa cells. These are located in the distal tubule. Physically, though, based on the orientation of the nephron, the macula densa cells are located in very close proximity to the afferent and efferent arterioles. And in fact, the macula densa exerts feedback control onto the afferent and efferent arterioles for the purpose of of regulating the renal blood flow and the glomerular filtration rate. And the final nephron segment is the medullary collecting duct. So the medullary collecting duct is located deep within the renal medulla, and it has two main roles. First is it works with the loop of Henle to help produce that hyperosmotic medullary interstitial fluid. This is accomplished by the reabsorption of urea, which augments the countercurrent multiplication process that takes place in the loop of Henle. And secondly, the medullary collecting duct is the final decision point for water reabsorption. This occurs via conditional water permeability that is stimulated by the presence of antidiuretic hormone. So the last little bit of that tubular fluid that makes its way to the medullary collecting duct, either it can be excreted and eliminated from the body as urine, or the water that comprises that tubular fluid can be reabsorbed and go back into circulation, or at least as much of it as possible, creating a very concentrated urine. And that's what's happening here. If antidiuretic hormone levels are elevated and therefore water permeability is high, then that water can move out of the collecting duct into the interstitial fluid and then ultimately back into circulation. And this is an important process for water conservation. So there you have it, the basic functions of the individual nephron segments and how they contribute to the kidney's ability to influence body fluid homeostasis. As you might imagine, there's an incredible array of cellular and molecular processes that are responsible for all the movements of the solute and the water that I've described. Please look for additional videos that will explain each of these processes so you have a more complete view of how the nephron functions.